all for joining us. My name is Amanda Graham. I am the Academic Director for the Arthur L. Irving Institute for Energy and Society here at Dartmouth College. And this series of new energy speakers is one that we've been running for just about two years now. Um, and we bring in young scholars in the energy and society space. So folks who are in their advanced PhD during, during a postdoc or an early stage assistant professor so that we can share amongst this group um, uh, the cutting edge, emerging research, emerging topics and ideas and then we can share that that um, beyond this group as well. And so it's really developed into a um, an impressive network of um, more than a dozen universities and um, many, many speakers over this, this first two years of the New Energy uh, program. So thank you for joining us today. Our talk today will focus on a really critical topic area of carbon offsets. And so I'm, I'm really interested in Dr. Probe's title here, Problem or Panacea. And I'm looking forward to, um, to getting to the end of that and seeing where you where you sit um, on that. But a few, a few words of introduction. Um, Dr. Benedict Probst is a senior researcher in the Sustainability and Technology Group at the Department of Management, Technology and Economics at ETH Zurich. He is also a fellow um, at the Center for Environment, Energy, and Natural Resource Govern Government um, at the University of Cambridge, <clears throat> where he earned his PhD and his um, Master's of Philosophy in Environmental Economics and Policy. He also has an MSc from the London School of Economics and a BSc from uh, Rotterdam School of Management. Uh, and so his talk today will be focusing on the rise in demand for carbon offsets, recognizing that there is conflicting evidence about um, whether or not they are effective. And what do we do about that conundrum? So uh, Benedict, let me hand it over to you. Great, thanks Amanda. Thanks for the kind introduction. So as Amanda said, my name is Ben Probst. I'm a senior researcher and lecturer in the group for sustainability and technology at, at ETH Zurich. And as Amanda said, my background is in finance, economics, and public policy. And in my work generally, I look um, at how policies, markets, and green finance can uh, accelerate or impede the transition towards a net zero emissions economy. And this work very much goes into that direction. So this is ongoing work um, with colleagues from the University of Cambridge, um, Laura, Laura diaz Anadon and Andreas Contolion, as well as colleagues from ETH Zurich, Malte Tötzke and Professor uh, Volker Hoffmann. And so um, this work is still ongoing. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to the discussion today, to your questions, to your input. And uh, feel also uh, free to write to me. Uh, my email address is here um, on the first slide if you have any questions or comments that you don't want to voice during the discussion. All right, so let me jump in. Um, so I want to briefly give you a background. Um, why are we doing this study? Um, and then also looking at the voluntary carbon market just to give you an overview of uh, recent market developments. Then I wanna jump into the paper methodology, our findings conclusion. Um, then we'll have a brief uh, Q and A and I'll um, you know, finish with a final takeaway. So um, very briefly about their background. So um, what is our, what, what does our group do? So we're an interdisciplinary research group led by Professor Volker Hoffmann. And we work basically on, on two main topics, that's energy and circular economy. And um, apart from, from you know, academic research, we're also very much interested in putting our academic work um, in, into practice. So for instance, we're running um, the first carbon removal startup accelerator in Europe at the moment, so we're trying to, to bridge research and practice as well. Um, so on the motivation for the paper. So as many of you know, around three fourths of the technologies that are needed to reach carbon neutrality um, are not ready yet. So this is modeling from the International Energy Agency around 25% are mature, but the rest is still in different phases, you know, ranging from early adoption for electric vehicles to other technologies that are in the prototype space. Um, and sectors that are, you know, typically very hard to decarbonize are, for instance, long haul transport, shipping, and aviation. So over the last years, we've seen um, 
quite an explosion in these kinds of statements. I'm sure you've seen them as well. Drive carbon neutral on, on the left by Shell or Brit British Airways tweeting about um, carbon neutral flying. Um, and this was very much, you know, the motivation for us to get into this topic is trying to un understand how valid um, are these claims. And um, that, you know, we, we, we got into this space because um, our team, but also of course other researchers had done quite a lot of work on looking um, at in individual projects. And so uh, within our team, we worked um, on forestry projects or the evaluation of forestry projects in Brazil, as you see on the top left and the top right but also on renewable energy project evaluations in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and other regions of the world. Um, and from, from that research, we, we knew that claims that, that are being made are not always, um, you know, do not always materialize in the span of the project. And um, so, so we got in, interested in to what extent actually offset projects um, do deliver the carbon benefits that they claim um, at the outset. And so, for instance, if you look at the top right, that's a study done by Andreas Contolion in, in Brazil, who's one of my co-authors on this uh, paper. And there they looked at 12 offset projects from Brazil, um, and they found that 11 of them very likely did not lead to additional emissions offsets or emissions reductions. Um, and so, we set out um, to, to do you know, the first large scale systematic uh, review of the global evidence then that we have for, for the, the carbon benefits or the, the actual emissions reduction of, of carbon offset projects. And um, we look at, and, and, and so to give you a background of the existing literature, they're essentially individual project evaluations like the one I just mentioned. Their policy reports, um, they're often or commonly done by, um, by think tanks. And then there are also papers on market design, um, uh, like uh, this one on, for instance, eligibility criteria. But what's really missing is um, a systematic review. And so with this project, we're, we're trying to, to bring together um, you, you know, the existing evidence and see what, uh, what we find. And before I jump into the paper methodology, I want to briefly speak about the voluntary carbon market. Um, so um, what we've seen over the last years um, is that there's re really been an explosion of voluntary carbon credits. And so as you can see here, um, voluntary carbon credits or the issuance has increased fourfold over the last 10 years. So um, the market is growing very rapidly. Um, and that's mainly driven by increasing climate ambitions of many countries and companies. And so, um, you, you know, I think they're, they're satisfying a certain demand that we have uh, within the market. And if we look at the, the distribution of credits then that are being issued, um, they're mainly from two sectors or around 75% um, are from two sectors. So from forestry and renewable energy. And then we have a range of of smaller sectors such as waste management, chemical processes, household and community. And these, these main sectors um, are then again subdivided into subsectors. So as you can see, um, the largest subsector is Red Plus. So this, this, these are projects uh, trying to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Um, but then if you look at renewable energy, for instance, wind is quite a prominent um, sector that, that issues offsets um, and within, for instance, the household and community space. So the household and community sector, um, fuel efficient cook stoves um, are quite um, a prominent uh, subsector. So, so as you can see, there are a range of different sectors. And in this study, um, we're trying to look at all of them as you will see later, um, there's limited evidence on some of these sectors, but and more on others. But I'll get to that in a second. And um, to give you an overview of how this market looks like, so so generally you have supply and demand, as in, in many other markets, and the and project developers generate supply of offsets, 
Um, and then we have off takers such as, for instance, aviation companies, Lufthansa, Shell. Um, and in, in the middle, you have market pl platform and verifiers such as gold standard, um, but also intermediaries. And these are often platforms where you can actually buy these offsets either as a business or an individual. Um, and within this study, we, we primarily focus on um, offsets that are generated via emissions reduction. So not carbon removal, this is still a very new market. And so the evidence is still limited. And we look essentially at avoided emissions uh, without storage, um, em, um, emission reductions with short-lived storage and emission reduction with long-lived storage, um, but, but not at carbon removal. And as I said, which you see to the right and um, avoided emissions uh, without storage typical projects are from the renewable energy space or cleaner cook stoves um, with some short-lived storage these are from mainly forestry projects um, such as avoided damage to ecosystems and then also emissions reductions with uh, long-lived storage from carbon capture and storage but we didn't find any um, rigorous empirical studies on, on that sector so um, that's a, that is a brief uh, sort of primer on the, the voluntary carbon market. Uh, let me now get to the paper methodology. So um, we essentially proceed in four steps to answer our main research question. So, so what we're trying to un understand is what's known in the scientific literature about the ex post outcomes and how, how they differ from the ex ante estimates from individual carbon offsetting project adopted to enable the transi transition towards a net zero emissions economy. And we proceed in four steps. So the first one is that we define keywords to identify potentially relevant scientific studies and search across Scopus and other large databases. And uh, we focus on the largest subsectors comprising around 90% of all issued carbon offsets to get a, a very wide um, and representative sample. Then we use an AI supported systematic literature tool, AS Review, which was uh, recently published in Machine uh, Human Intelligence, which you're free, which you're welcome to look up, um, and uh, filter for relevant studies. So, so these studies um, are experimental or quasi-experimental studies, which means um, that they, they look at an offset project or a similar project, um, but they actually have a, a counterfactual, which means that they answer the question, what would have happened you know, in the absence of that project? And typical experimental projects are, for instance, from the development economics literature. I mean, a study flow and, and colleagues made that very um, you know, popular, I think. Um, randomized controlled trials. Um, these are very common in, for instance, cookstove studies, um, where a part of the participants gets a more fuel efficient um, cookstove and another group doesn't, and then um, the, the researchers compare the outcomes across these uh, two groups. And quasi-experimental studies are often used within the forestry space because their randomization is very difficult, and so other statistical methods are, are used, such as propensity score matching. Um, and so we identify these re relevant studies, and from a subset of, of, of 50,000 studies, um, with, with this tool. And then we download the full text of the studies and manually check them for relevance. And then two researchers actually independently extracted the empirical estimates. Um, and then in the last step, we, we use the average retail cost of carbon offsets to calculate the real price factoring in, you know, the, the additionality or the, the, the real carbon benefit or, or, or reduction that was generated or that we estimate by our, by, via our systematic literature review to actually calculate the real price of an offset, offset if additionality is considered. And so um, briefly to give you an idea of, of how normally the, these, carbon these carbon savings are calculated, so normally a project developer calculates these ex ante, so before the project is implemented. And so you have a, a, a baseline projection, what would happen without the project and then an emissions production uh, with the project. Um, the main thing is that we only know about the true carbon savings after the project, uh, so exposed. And so to, to calculate additionality, 
what we essentially do is that we divide the real carbon savings. So these are, you know, the, the exposed um, estimated carbon savings um, by the ex ante ex um, expected savings. And so for instance, if a project claimed to offset 100 tons, um, but only offset 10, 10 tons in, in the end, then this would be an additionality of 10%. And um, since there are only few studies that actually look at, at projects that officially issued carbon offsets, we also consider projects that did not officially um, issue carbon offsets, but also seek to reduce or remove emissions. Um, and, and we do this to expand the evidence pool and to actually consider studies that are very good, but um, did not officially look at, at uh, carbon offset generating projects. So for in instance, as I mentioned before, Esther de Flo's work on, on cook stoves is excellent, um, but um, these projects that did not officially issue carbon offsets, but are likely very similar to projects that officially did. And so, um, for these projects that did not officially issue offset credits, we we calculate we calculate um, ex ante estimated um, emissions reductions. For instance, for cook stoves, we use um, you know reports from lab tests to calculate what one would expect if one used the the methodology of verifiers, and uh, we we use a similar methodology for forestry where we use baseline deforestation rates to create an ex ante baseline, um, which we compare the the exposed um, the the exposed estimates uh, against. And so our final sample compri comprises. 3,148 projects from 22 studies. So as you can um, imagine, not, not um, studies normally um, evaluate multiple projects. And so um, for, for, for other sectors, so, so we have four main sectors, as, as you can see here, forestry, renewable energy, households, and chemical, chemical processes. And within um, these main sectors, the subsectors that we found, um, relevant empirical studies for um, were red plus cook stoves wind and 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 to destruction um, and overall as i said 22 uh, studies and 3148 uh, projects um, that doesn't sound like, like a lot but um, but that's the best evidence um, that we could find all right so let's jump in, in into the findings and discussion so Overall, we find that the additionality is between uh, three to 36 percent, but there's substantial um, heterogeneity within and across sectors. So, um, if we look at the the graph on on the left, um, we found the lowest additionality for for cook stove projects. So this this is within the household sector, uh, with around three percent additionality. The second lowest was renewable energy. These are wind projects with around 10 percent and then chemical processes with around 30% and forestry and land use with around 35% additionality. And so I'm again to reiterate what I said before, um, an additionality of let's say 10% um, means that you need 10 times as many offset credits to actually offset um, a ton of carbon. Um, and so these are, are, are quite low, I think across the board. But as I said, with uh, sub substantial heterogeneity um, within these sectors, which you see on, on the right. So the left, um, these are average, you know, it's the weighted additionality across sectors and we weigh them by the, the number of treated units um, per, per study. And on the right, you see the individual estimates and there's a lot of heterogeneity within these sectors. Um, but I, I think overall, um, we find um, quite low, low additionality, as I said, across um, these sectors. Um, and, and so to, to look at, let's say, the real price, um, if we consider additionality, so on the left, you see, um, you know, the, the carbon cost curve. Um, so that, you know, cost range between 9 to 20 euros per ton um, in retail tail price across these different sectors. Now, if, if we consider our estimates from, from the last slide, then, then we see that 
um, let's say the real cost of these offsets need to be multiplied by a factor between 2.8 and 34, depending on, um, on, on the estimated additionality. Of course, um, we estimate sensitivities to into these numbers. These are just sort of um, average figures, but this shows that um, on, on the one hand, um, the real prices are substantially higher and for, for some there, there, there are, um, you know, even more than a hundred euros per ton, such as um, renewable energy, which we estimate to, to, to cost substantially more like 163 or um, offset projects that are the most expensive um, carbon offset sector that we, we uh, calculate. Um, but of course, we just spoke about um, additionality. Um, if we look at permanence, uh, which is another important factor, um, then we see that that there, there's a wide range of, of estimates. So this is for forestry now. What you see here um, on, on, on the left um, essentially are renewal, renewal periods, which means if you had to renew a forestry offset, every five years or 20 years or, or 100 years, um, you would get very different costs. Um, and then also discount rates. So we, we do a normal uh, net present value analysis for the offset cost. And so um, we see that for, for very um, frequent renewal periods like five years and, and low discount rates um, that the, the cost of forestry offsets could be substantially higher. So they could be between 100 and 700 euros per ton. So, so the, the 34 euros per ton that we estimate might be a substantial underestimate given that for some offsets, there might be um, you know, a, renewal, a, a renewal that is required um, to actually um, create the benefits or to, to create uh, permanent carbon removals as forestry commonly is just a temporary uh, removal. So um, let's jump into the sort of the, the main uh, the main takeaways from these four different sectors. So for for forestry and especially red plus, we found the highest additionality, but overall I'd say it's still quite low additionality of around 30%. If we only look at studies, that officially issued carbon offsets, it's substantially lower, on, only around 5%, but there are very few studies. Um, common problems with um, these forestry projects that there is that they're often in areas with low overall deforestation risk, um, which obviously decreases the likelihood that these projects avoid deforestation. Um, and so better targeted red plus projects um, do have the potential to lower deforestation, but targeting, I think, remains one of the central issues. Um, and the overall intervention length of our studies was, um, was just 7.5 years. So for most studies, they only cover a short period of time, so we don't know what happens after that. What actually surprised me personally quite a lot was that there's very limited um, evidence on afforestation, so very few empirical studies that look at um, the effect um, of, of afforestation on, on carbon savings, especially the effect of subsidies for afforestation and, and related carbon savings. So the only uh, rigorous study that we could find was an econometric sim simulation and that found no carbon savings from afforestation because it replaced um, virgin forest. Um, and, and so the overall carbon balance was zero. Um, and another study from China showed that um, the, the, for, the soil disturbance from afforestation can even lead to an overall loss of carbon um, due to disturbance of carbon rich soils. So, so I guess, especially for afforestation, much more work is needed, but the, the relationship between trees planted and carbon, <clears throat> excuse me, and carbon saved um, seems to be quite complex. Um, for chemical processes, um, such as projects um, um, that, that didn't destroy N N2O and SF6, um, they should in theory yield very high additionalities, but the literature shows that there's a risk of uh, perverse incentives. So that means that there's an overproduction of these substances to actually generate excess credits, 
um, in, in, in the clean development mechanism. Uh, in theory, there should be safeguards um, against this, but um, qualitative research still indicates that this might be an issue even today. Um, for wind or for re renewable energy in general, uh, we, we found the second lowest additionality in our sample. Um, to be honest, I wasn't very su surprised by that. Um, if any, any one of you has ever worked in, in renewable energy finance, um, renewable energy projects require really high upfront investments and a secure cash flow. So um, I'd say that the bankability of a renewable en energy projects is only marginally affected by the ability to sell offsets, especially if these offset markets are very, very volatile and prices change a lot, then a bank, I think, will, will not change the outlook on um, you, you know, the, the, the bankability of a project because of that. And so um, that didn't surprise me that much. And, and the last uh, one is household and community and especially cook stoves. Um, so generally cook stoves um, claim to offer win-win solutions but um, across these empirical studies, um, there, there are very few that actually show high additionality. There are two studies with limited sample sizes that found somewhat higher additionalities, um, but ov overall we find low additionality. And this is probably because these fuel efficient cook stoves um, are not a substitute for the existing stoves, but um, are rather used as a complement. And so this might actually then fully offset the, the emissions reductions that the more fuel efficient stove generated in the first place. Um, but, but here again, the stove type might be quite important to the actual impact of the project itself. So um, our conclusion. So this is the first um, systematic literature review that synthesizes the the additionalities of around 3000 offset projects um, by actually using the exposed estimates across uh, different studies. And so our results in indicate that the current offset prices may not fully um, reflect the cost of removing a ton of carbon from, from the atmosphere because of additionality and permanence issues. As I stated, um, we find the, the lowest um, additionality for cook stove credits and, and the highest uh, for forestry related credits, but overall, I think um, additionality is a problem across all of these sectors. And of course, um, these results should, should be seen as an exploratory analysis. I think much more work is needed in, in, in that regard, especially given um, the explosion of carbon credits across the last um, year. So, so much more work is needed, but I think, you know, generally, uh, as a, a problem with these uh, carbon offset projects is that these uh, carbon reductions are estimated before the project, and so um, the exposed um, analysis or the you know the exposed analysis might look very different to the the expected carbon um, reduction before the project, and so I think. Um, there is a case for these exposed in issuance of carbon credits, such as the National uh, Guyana Red Plus project, where the, the credits were issued after um, the project, not before. And I think generally it's, it's key to invest more in high quality studies, evaluating offsets, um, but also to improve offset quality and to, in the long run, move to carbon removal and, and storage, such as direct air capture or other uh, neg negative emissions technologies um, before you know, scaling voluntary carbon markets. All right, thank you very much for, for participating. And of course, thank you also to my co-authors uh, that you see on this slide. Looking forward to your questions. Benedict, thank you very much for, um, for a really interesting um, uh, and, and thorough um, uh, review, right, of both what uh, the carbon offset market looks like um, and your evaluation of the evaluations, right, of, <laughs> um, of effectiveness uh, of, um, of carbon offsetting. 
Um, one of the very first questions um, that was submitted, and please folks submit your question through the Q&A icon um, uh, to bring a question into the into the mix. Um, the first question that we received is, um, um, is this work that you can, can you share these slides, right? Has this work been published yet? So are these slides shareable? So we're, um, we're in the process of publishing a discussion draft of this because I'm sure that many people will be interested in this work. And uh, of, of course, it's also somewhat controversial. So uh, we're, we're gathering comments at the moment from different actors. So this will be published within the next days. That's great. If, and if, you, if you're willing to, to share any link for um, a discussion draft, we'd be happy mm -hmm. to um, place that on our website for folks to follow mm -hmm. up. Can you go back to your your um, final conclusions slide just one quick sec? I mean, to me, I think that the 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 most significant um, finding here is this one, two, three, four, the fifth, right? The current approach of assessing emissions abatement potential ex ante significantly overestimates the true addition additionality, right? And so I think that mm -hmm. this, this is this is the big um, to me the big the big takeaway is that what we're doing right now, right in um, in the carbon offset world. Um, is um, inflating, right? Our mm -hmm. um, is based on an inflation, right? Of right. Um, the, the actual benefits that they that they have, and and um, and also I think um, a, um, um, a not a true reflection of what the cost actually would be to get those mm -hmm. emissions that um, that we needed. Do you want to speak a little bit more to the um, you know the significance of that of that result or that that implication? Mm -hmm. Um, and yes. um, any any initial conversations you've had with um, with um, folks who are reviewing the work? Mm -hmm. So so yeah, I mean I think on I mean I think um, that especially for for you know let let's take forestry as an example. Um, I mean you do need some sort sort of sort of ex ante estimate to 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 get the sense of what the potential you know carbon volume that your project could sell. Um, could be, but but of course we only know after the project what the true um, abatement was, um, and 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 that is because in many places it's just very hard to know, or these these, these projects are just very complex, right? And um, for anyone who's ever worked on forestry in Brazil, for instance, um, if you have a change in in beef prices, right, during the the the, the, the project implementation. That, would, that might increase deforestation pressures significantly. And so um, it's very hard to, to, to project or to, to predict these exogenous shocks during these projects. So that's why it's so important to, um, to have these ex post um, you know, evaluations. And I mean, generally, I think um, one danger is that we do not do proper you know, mitigation, that we don't invest in the technologies um, to actually mit mitigate these emissions, but um, um, by you know hot hot air credits that might not actually be genuine emissions reductions, and I think that uh, obviously is not good to to combat climate change, um, and might also set set back the investment in the technologies that are needed. Thank you for that. A number of questions that came in before the talk today um, uh, were sort of on a theme that responds to a um, something that you that you touched on just very briefly towards the end. If carbon off offsets are not the solution, then what is right? So mm. what, what 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 other options um, can we pursue if carbon offsets are are not doing the job that we want them to do? Do you want to flesh out your response to that just a little bit more? Right. Um, so, so that was actually one of my key takeaways, perhaps an outlook on what could be done. Um, but perhaps I, I can quickly go, go to that slide. So, so on the right, what do you see? Um, this, this is from the Oxford offsetting principles. I think in the long run, it will be critical to move a, away from offsets um, that actually focus on avoided emissions, let's say from forestry or cook stoves and move more into carbon removal with long lived storage. So that could, could be direct air capture, for instance, uh, with storage, which is just much easier to, to track your actual carbon removal. Um, whereas for forestry projects, it's just much messier to calculate this. Even, even with better satellites and better econometrics, it will be very tricky to know what, what the exact effect of a project is. Whereas for carbon removal, with long-lived storage, I think it's it's much it can be much easier, 
And I think gen generally offsets can just be one part of the solution, right? We need good policies. We need investment in clean technologies and sort of the whole breadth um of of potential measures that we, that we can take to 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 combat climate change i mean i think uh, offsets will just be one part of the solution um but you know i think at, at the moment given our results i don't think um the carbon offsets as they stand are are a big part of the solution at the moment right well and i think this your your point there really <clears throat> highlights the the um the imperative of long-lived solution, long-lived storage um, uh, challenges, which is something obviously that that we're still, um, you know, that's still in the proving stages. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, let's go to uh, other questions from uh, from today. Um, so Ella Bryman is asking for a quick explanation, um, a, a little bit more detail. I'm, I'm going to say a little bit more detail about how the AI-generated literature process worked. Mm -hmm. So, so in the first step, we we um, identified the keywords, and as I said, across these different sectors, and then we had a sort of a large sample out, out of fifty thousand um, studies that were potentially relevant, but most are, are not. As any, anyone who's ever done a, a literature review knows, there are very few studies that are actually relevant. And so, what the 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 AS review software does is that it gives you an article and you have to rank it whether it's re relevant or not and based on on your um, input it actually learns which articles are re relevant and this then gives you a ranking of um, all studies um, and so that allows you to focus much more on you know the most re relevant studies and um, you know i think also limits the the risk that you miss an article so so how traditionally i think literature reviews are done is that people click through the list of articles and so if you you read 2000 um, titles it's very likely that you will miss one very relevant study and if out of 2000 articles only five are are relevant then there's quite a high risk i i, I think that one could miss these relevant studies so with the software um, based on, on natural language processing, the software essentially learns which are the most relevant articles and suggests them to you um, in sort of a, a list file, and then you can go through them. So, so I think this will really improve in the long run, also the quality of literature reviews. Thank you. Uh, John Jeffers asks, would you expect additionality to generally decrease over time as more carbon reducing activities become business as usual? So I'm sorry. So so whether an offset project itself will become less additional over time, or no? I think I think um, across across a set. Sorry, could you could you repeat the question? I didn't fully get it. Would you expect additionality to generally decrease over time, as more carbon reducing activities become business as usual? Hmm. I mean. That's a good question. I'm, I mean, I think generally, um, one one. I mean, on the one one hand, we could think that we're picking the low hanging fruit, right? And so, as right. we move in, into other projects, um, there's gone gone to be low additionality. At, at the same time, I think what we're seeing at the moment is because of worries about low additionality. <clears throat> there are a range of, of for instance, companies coming up like Silvera in London. That are trying to use, you know, cutting-edge AI and and sat satellite imagery to actually, um, you know, assess the, the 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 quality of offsets. So I think um, as there's a need at the moment for better offsets, um, there's also now I think a lot of private sector attention that that goes in into this. So so I wouldn't say that I expect um, these efforts to decrease. I mean, I think um, with these in, in increased efforts and more focus on, on the sector, one could actually expect um, that the additionality goes up mm -hmm. over time, but it's very hard to know um, because I think for some sectors, it, it's just too complex to, to, to properly you know, Im implement these projects. So for instance, I think forestry is, is one good example, which is just a very complex 
you know, socioeconomic setting, setting where these projects are Im implemented, for instance, in the Brazilian Amazon with very weak institutions. Um, it's just very hard, I think, to, to, to enforce, um, you know, whatever project standards you, you have at the beginning, or at least it's, it's challenging. Um, along those lines, do you have any suggestions for actions that would improve carbon offset markets, right? So you made a recommendation that we need to shift away from carbon offset markets to, you know, more long lived storage. But in the, mm -hmm. in the meantime, you know, what recommendations do you have to, to, to do a better job with the carbon off offset markets that we that we that currently exist? Mm. So, so I think one interesting approach, um, and as I said before, what the Guayana Red Project did is that they actually issued offsets um, exposed. So I think that could be one approach, <clears throat> which is, you know, I think a more rigorous uh, way of deal dealing with the additionality um, concerns. I think um, for for existing projects, um, it's very important that we really look into, as we did here, the additionality and perhaps also exclude certain offsets um from from offsetting schemes such as Corsia, which now looks at M aviation that um you, you know they don't include um offsets that that are potentially not additional and so i think uh, there's an in interesting academic work going going on to identify which sectors could be included which sec sectors uh, should be excluded um so 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 i think that's one one other point um, but but yeah, I know of many businesses who want to buy offsets, but are just very unhappy with the current state of the market. And I think this this will prevail for some time until more high quality credits um, you, you know come into the market. But companies such as Climeworks or Carbon Engineering, um, I think, are doing in interesting work on these negative emission credits that I think are much more robust and and easier to to trace. Well, and that may answer actually the next question that I wanted to pose. Um, what's the best source of information about high quality offsets for those of us working on climate who want personal offsets? So if, you, mm -hmm. if there are other other recommendations you'd have for where to mm -hmm. look. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So there, there, there is actually now an NGO uh, that works on this. Um, and that's and they're 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 called Giving Green um, dot Earth, and so they look at different offsets, um, and they for each offset sector they have the latest studies, and you know, I think generally they provide a very good summary. They don't have these additionality estimates, but I think they have quite a clear methodology in how to they they assess them on a more qualitative um, basis. And so that's givinggreen.earth, which um, I think is a good resource for, for people who are interested in buying offsets themselves. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, sort of on a, another angle on that question, how can practitioners and researchers include distributional concerns such as in energy or environmental justice populations into assessing offsets? Mm. Do you know if Giving Green um, uh, addresses that at all? Um, so I don't think Giving Green addresses that, and of course that's another very important question when when it comes to carbon offsets and something that we didn't focus on in this study because it was on already hard enough to get these additionality numbers. But of course um, that's another important uh, question because uh, you, these projects are often implemented in the global south and. Um, there might be so socioeconomic and distributional effects that 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 are negative for certain populations, um, but uh, we didn't look at this, um, you know, in this case. But this might be a you know an interesting follow up study to to come from this. So so thanks for for that question. Yeah, great, great. Um, Andy Heller asks, how do you feel about carbon taxes as an alternative to speed to speed more towards carbon reduction? Yeah, so so I think carbon taxes are the cornerstone um, of climate policy. So I mean, we we've seen, for instance, in, in the European Union with the European Emissions Trading Scheme, that's worked uh, relatively well as of late because now prices are increasing to around 100 euros per ton. So so I think 
there we're actually seeing quite a lot of pressure on for instance electric utilities to decarbonize um, so so i think carbon taxes are a great um, way way of decarbonizing the economy if they're implemented um, correctly meaning that they actually properly reflect the the marginal cost of carbon um, at, at the same time, again, with carbon taxes, there are these distributional concerns, right? They, they can be regressive in the sense that low-income households are, are hit hardest. And so I think politically it's important to, um, to actually disperse the, the, um, the income generated, you know, through these carbon taxes in a way that these regressive effects are attenuated. And I think that's that's possible. It's it's not super easy easy to do this in an on an administrative in an ad, ad, administrative way. But I think um, many countries are thinking about how to, how to redistribute these carbon taxes. And I mean another way, um, what the European Union is doing is to actually invest um, the carbon revenues um, into. Um, clean technology research, which I think is another very important area um, and where, you know, these carbon taxes can, can be recycled. Uh, let's see. John Minderman asks, <clears throat> in your research, did you find any correlation between additionality and offset price? Does the price follow the differences in additionality so the cost of avoided carbon is relatively constant? Mm. So, so what we, I, I'm, I can go back to, to the slide. So we saw rel relatively low um, additionality for cook stoves and there, they were actually um, on, on the higher price. end. so there we see a negative correlation yeah. um, between price and, and additionality. Um, I think overall the additionality is quite low and prices are quite low. So, so it's hard to, to disentangle um, a pattern, but over, overall, I wouldn't say that that price and quality are necessarily correlated in in, in the current market. Um, a question submitted prior to our to our meeting today um, by somebody I think who who's um, uh, optimistic or or hopeful about the use the potential use of carbon offsets. Um, how can a university structure carbon offsets to raise revenue for energy efficiency and green infrastructure projects on campus? I mean, ba based on your findings, you know, is, is this, you know, is, is the, the, the viability, right, of, of, of supporting carbon off offsets is, is something that I think that you're, that you're, um, you know, the, the work is putting in question. And so it may mm -hmm. be that it, shouldn't be used by a university um, right for a, as a funding source but I but have you have you pondered that question about um, the the either the current or the future possibilities for mm. carbon offset markets yeah so so I mean I think for a university or a single in institution to generate offsets it would be quite um, expensive to actually get these offsets verified so so I think Offsets commonly only make sense if you can generate quite a large volume of offsets. Otherwise, the you know the costs of verification are just too high um, to actually um, you know to um, to gen gen generate offsets at a reasonable price. Um, and I think more more fundamentally, as you say, I mean I'm not sure whether offsets are really you know a, a funding structure that that induce decarbonization just because um, for many projects um, you, you, you need a secure revenue stream um, to make them bankable as i said before for renewable energy projects for instance um, what made a lot of re renewable energy projects viable is that we had feed-in tariffs that said we pay you 20 cents per kilowatt hour for 20 years or whatever it was um, and so with carbon offsets these markets are often extremely volatile, right? I mean, if you look at at, at voluntary car, um, at, at the prices in these voluntary carbon markets, they fluctuate, um, and they're they're very uncertain revenue streams. So I'm I don't think that this per se um, is is the right funding structure for university or smaller projects. But I also think for larger infrastructure projects, I, I'm not sure whether whether carbon offsets 
are the right uh, way forward. And so one, what we're seeing, for instance, in, in, in the negative emission space at the mo moment is um, our advanced market commitments so that a range of players get together, such as, I don't know, McKinsey and other companies and say, we, we will buy one billion worth of carbon of neg negative carbon em em emissions you know, offsets um, over the next 10 years. And so a company can go to the bank and say, look, um, there's, you know, there are these advanced market com commitments, um, perhaps they'll buy from us. And so give me a loan. And I think that is a much clearer um, revenue stream with these advanced market commitments. And these vol voluntary markets have been to date where you have uh, you know, a price that is determined by by demand and supply, and if you have a lot of supply, these can plum. You know, the prices can can plummet. So I think um, there's a lot to to be learned from renewable energy and the, you know, the the, the feed in tariff uh, schemes that have ac actually brought renewable energy to market. Um, yeah. Could you reflect a little bit about um, what your what your next um, uh research study plans are i mean where where do you go from here um with uh, with this thread of work yeah that's a that's an interesting question so um i'm i'm, I'm quite interested in the uh, the negative emission space so, so as i said before um we're currently um, implementing a startup accelerator for negative emissions and so, so one follow-up study that, that that I could see on this is actually to evaluate the effectiveness of um, you know these startup accelerators on bringing these new technologies to market, and um, that could be a potential follow-up follow because, as we as I said before, I think in the long run it will be critical to shift to more um, to negative emissions with uh, you know with proper storage, and so I think that could be one potential extension of that work um but but yeah as we're still gathering uh, comments and in inputs on, on on this study i'm sure there will be uh, you know a, a lot of new potential avenues for exploring um this topic further i'm looking for a final question here and i, I think that the the final question that um uh, asked by a couple of folks in a, in a little bit of a different way is, you know, um, the, is this question about long-term storage, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, one one um, uh, participant just directly asks, why do you think carbon capture and storage will be more effective given, you know, that, the, that we have uh, ecological or ecosystem implications of those that we're still trying to learn about, as well as scaling challenges, right, that we're trying to mm. figure out how well the technology will work. And so you, you, it sounds as though you're pretty bullish on the idea of, of long-term storage, but um, maybe tell us a little bit more about why you're bullish about it, you know, from a technological or and or uh, economic perspective and mm. um, uh, uh, whether you think that the, you know, the environmental concerns are um, uh, are being effectively addressed as that technology mm. is seeking to become more mature. Yeah, no, I mean, I think there are legitimate concerns about the environmental effects on, on, of it. And, you know, generally I'm all for mitigation first and then um, trying to to address, you know, the hard uh, to abate sectors later on until we have technological solutions. So that as a preamble um, and, you know, I think we're there, there are very few projects that, that are actually looking into long-term storage we're seeing you know the first projects off the coast of the Netherlands, off, off the you know the coast of Norway. Climeworks just um, you know in, implemented its first direct air capture project in Iceland, with storage uh, there. And so, so, so I think the next years will be critical to learn more about the environmental effects. And I'm not an engineer, so it's hard for me to to assess the you know the, the full scope of an, an environmental effects, but. Um, I do think that these, you know, you know pilot plans will, will be critical in understanding the, the, the effects much more. And so um, perhaps I'm bullish about, you know, at least trying different solutions and not per se about the technology itself. Excellent. 
Um, Benedict, thank you so much for joining us today. This is this is a really fruitful discussion and um, uh, provocative research and and interesting <laughs> findings. We look forward to um, to seeing the. Um, uh, the discussion paper when it comes out and the discussion mm -hmm. of the discussion paper right, <laughs> as, it, as it emerges into the literature and, and folks have a chance to um, to engage with it. So we'll be watching and um, and really appreciate having the chance to, to get a preview here um, here today. So um, many thanks um, to you for joining us in the new energy series. Great. Thanks, Amanda. You bet. Um, so just a note for our audience, um, this is our last New Energy speaker of the spring term, so stay tuned for future in the series um, coming up after a summer break. Uh, and um, our next and last event um, at the Irving Institute um, is next week. It is an online event um, with Karen Hanghoi from the British Geological Survey, um, who will be um, rounding out our series of talks on min metals, minerals, and materials and energy. And her, um, her talk is framed critical minerals and critical thinking. What is the problem? So join us for that next week, um, next Tuesday uh, at 1215. Um, and um, we... Uh, uh, look forward to seeing you there. Um, enjoy the great weather in um, in Zurich. We're certainly enjoying it here in Hanover. And um, wherever you are, stay well. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much.